Hi everybody, this is Daniel Chris from Prehistoric Facts, and uh, sorry I'm being a little late for this episode, uh, considering that it's kind of got a lot, kind of got a little crazy uh, yesterday. But uh, anyway, I'm gonna get get the special episode done today. So actually, let's actually get right to it. So the di the animals that we're gonna be talking about today are actually uh, reptiles that actually have lived uh, in the Cretaceous, basically the late Cretaceous. And one of them is a marine reptile, and the other one is a pterosaur. And so, we're going to be talking about Elasmosaurus and Quetzalcoatlus. Let's start with Elasmosaurus. Elasmosaurus, uh, and I can't remember what the name means, but even though um, it's a, it's a, it's a plesiosaur, basically, around, 50, around 40 to 50 feet long, um, would have probably weighed around... Five tons, and uh, and of course its diet is is basically fishes and it was basically fish and squid, and uh, the reason why uh, Elasmosaurus is this huge is because you see the ox because you see the marine reptiles in the Cretaceous actually kind of got pretty big, but even though the marine the golden age of marine reptiles is right around the late Jurassic and the early Cretaceous. But even though it was when the late Cretaceous actually kind of came around is when the seas became the most dangerous. Elasmosaurus probably would have actually uh, started started to actually be around Earth around the, pretty close to 95 million years ago. And it actually survived near, near to the end of the dinosaurs, which is near to the end of the Mesozoic, pretty much around 66 or 65.5 million years ago. And that actually... Kind of shows that this this marine reptile was very successful, and basically, uh, Elasmosaurus was actually named by Edward Drinker Cope. He actually also discovered it, and this was actually the animal that actually kind of got started with kind of got kind of started the Bone Wars, basically with between uh, Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Charles Marsh, and. And you see the reasons why is because you see when Cope actually discovered Elasmosaurus, he actually kind of looked at the bones, tried to figure out the, its anatomy, and so basically he thought the neck was actually going to be pretty short, and he thought that Elasmosaurus had a, this really long tail. But when he actually presented it to the scientific community, uh, Othniel Charles Marsh was also there, and he actually saw. Uh, the ball he actually saw a mistake that Edward Drinker Cope made and that was he put the skull on the wrong end which is basically he put the skull on the tail which is basically Cope put the skull on the tail not really uh, where the neck really is but and you see that embarrassed uh, Cope so much that uh, he tried to actually make this correction but it was too late and so what happened was is that Cope was actually kind of discredited with his scientific uh, analysis of Elasmosaurus and thought that Cope would make mistakes in the future. But basically, Cope actually was really angry about this. He did not like Othniel Charles Marsh at all. And that was pretty much the start of the Bone Wars. But with Elasmosaurus... Uh, there's been most of the fossils have been found in North America, uh, pretty much around the Western Interior Seaway, uh, pretty much uh, basically uh, from northern Canada all the way down to uh, Texas, and so that would actually make this a wide wide range of plesiosaur, and we know it's a plesiosaur because it has this really long neck, uh, very stout body, uh, pretty much, and it. And pretty much, it would be a slow-moving marine reptile. Plesiosaurs were not fat; were not very fast at all, especially the large ones. Large ones wouldn't actually be very fast, it's because you see, they don't need to be fast to actually uh, catch their prey. It's because that's why they have these really long necks and small heads. And what, and what, and no, and in those, in the mouths of these, of these animals is, is, is pretty much needle-sharp teeth. And they're conical shape, which means they're going after prey that is that they're trying to grab and hang on, and basically put it in their mouth pretty quick. 
which is basically fish, squid, uh, any invertebrates. It would not go after uh, other marine reptiles. That's because it's basically it's not part of its diet. Uh, many, like almost a hundred years ago, almost hundreds of years ago, uh, when uh, the first plesiosaurs were actually found, they actually did think that plesiosaurs did actually hunt some marine reptiles. But basically, that's discredited. That's actually a myth. So pretty much that shows that Elasmosaur that plesiosaurs were only fish and uh, invertebrate uh, feeders, basically. It's because they can sneak uh, their heads right into a school of fish and then pretty much snap, 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 snap. Grab any kind of, grab as many fish as it can to actually, uh, actually satisfy its hunger. Now, plesiosaurs would actually have predators. It would have predators, especially the juveniles. Juveniles would be very vulnerable uh, to predators. Elasmosaurus, during this time, uh, would have actually had to worry about uh, sharks, basically. Uh, large sharks like Cretoxyrhina, uh, one of the largest sharks in the Mesozoic era. But also the number one uh, predator it has to worry about is mosasaurs. Mosasaurs would actually have been... The worst enemy uh, for Elasmosaurus, especially to the juveniles. Juveniles would actually be in danger of being uh, killed by Mosasaurus, especially giant Mosasaurus like Tylosaurus. Tylosaurus would actually have eaten a juvenile uh, Plesiosaurus uh, pretty good, uh, basically. It would probably could actually uh, kill a juvenile that is nearly half the size of an adult Elasmosaurus. And so, uh, but even though with ad adults, adults were had no predators, and actually had no predators, uh, but even though when they actually did die, s sharks would have actually fed on the bodies, and uh, some, uh, like, uh, crustaceans and all that sorts of stuff. But, I mean, that's how, that's how life is in the oceans. But, of course, extinction of Elasmosaurus happened basically like with all the other uh, reptiles and uh, dinosaurs that actually were around around 66 or 65.5 million years ago, which is basically the KT extinction or KPG uh, extinction. It's because of basically an asteroid came along and actually uh, wiped out uh, animals that were actually in its range, and so pretty much and and also pretty much uh, killed all killed pretty much large animals that actually could not survive the events that actually made that actually made happen after the impact and so that's how Elasmosaurus actually kind of came to be and the next uh, uh, animal that we're going to be talking about is one of the largest pterosaurs Quetzalcoatlus and Quetzalcoatlus is a feathered uh, wing god basically and um, and uh, it's it's fossils have found them in North America. Uh, wingspan of this animal is 40 feet. 40 feet wings. 40 foot wingspan. Think about that. That's that's almost as big as some. That's almost as big as uh, some small planes. And uh, and pretty much uh, the height of Elasmosaurus is actually the same height as a giraffe, a modern giraffe. And it, can you believe that a 40-foot wingspan and as tall as a giraffe on all fours? That is unbelievable. And uh, it would have weighed prior between, uh, let's say, 300 to 600 pounds. And uh, fossils have been mostly found in North America, but even though there could possibly be uh, other fossils around the world that could actually have Quetzalcoatlus fossils. But anyway, Quetzalcoatlus. Is a ver is one of the largest pterosaurs that have ever lived. That actually lived in the Cretaceous, pretty much late Cretaceous, around six, 75 to 66 or 66, 65.5 million years ago. Excuse me. Uh, and also, and basically, with uh, Quetzalcoatlus, uh, it has no teeth. Basically, it's just a beak. And for a uh, pterosaur, see, pterosaurs were starting to lose teeth uh, as they actually kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger. It's because uh, they're not because you see with teeth if you're going to be um, pretty much uh, feeding on fish, uh, you really don't want to have teeth get in the way. It's because sometimes fish could actually get away. It's because of 
because they can probably feel the teeth. And so with a beak, the fish don't even see it coming. So pretty much it's very easy. But Quetzalcoatlus could also actually feed on small dinosaurs and even small reptiles, uh, small amphibians, and even small mammals if it had to. Now pretty much when I say small dinosaurs, I mean hatchlings. Basically like theropod hatchlings, uh, kind of like a Tyrannosaurus rex uh, hatchlings or Dromaeosaur uh, hatchlings or Troodontid uh, hatchlings. I don't really know if we could actually go after um, like a hatchling uh, Triceratops or I probably could actually uh, uh, snatch up a hatchling and Montasaur. So that would probably be very interesting to see. Now, when Quetzalcoatlus is in the air, it's uh, just a big body in the air. It's almost like a giant plane in the air. Now, with the other ter like other pterosaurs, uh, it actually had a very elongated uh, fourth finger. It, that's what it actually has. It's an elongated fourth finger. And so pretty much if you actually take this finger, your ring finger, and actually extend it four feet longer, and then pretty much and you actually add some skin to actually uh, be the w wing membrane and there you have it you got yourself a pterosaur and so and pretty much this wing membrane would actually have connected towards uh, the legs and so that would actually you know also uh, on land it would actually be very cl almost clumsy uh, on land but even though it could actually kind of almost it can see pterosaurs have this unusual way of walking uh, on all fours on land so it's very foreign uh, if we went back in time probably like, say 70 million years ago and we actually saw a Quetzalcoatlus on land we would actually think that this is not a, this this movement uh, on all fours for a pterosaur like this this huge is unrealistic it seems unrealistic but even though it does happen but all, but you see scientists have actually have wondered how does a giant pterosaur like this get off the ground and a lot of people thought that they probably live near cliffs and, and that's why they actually just kind of dove down right on the warm air currents uh, that actually were above uh, the, the oceans and all that but I'd say that they're probably they probably did fine on land. It's because you see, pterosaurs probably did a little bit of like a push up uh, to get up in the air, and you see that's why uh, scientists have actually studied the the arm bones of of uh, large pterosaurs, and they actually see that the the humerus, the upper arm bone, is very strong, and so they probably did have uh, a good amount of weight that they can push. Uh, with a, a tremendous amount of force and so they probably had very large uh, biceps and triceps to actually help themselves uh, actually boost themselves off to the ground and pretty much vampire bats actually do this vampire bats actually do a little bit of a push-up to actually get up in the air but vampire bats tend to sometimes actually hang on uh, uh, like uh, upside down sometimes but basically they actually do a little bit of a push-up and that's why uh, their arm, arm muscles are so strong. It probably did have very strong shoulder and back muscles. And you see with pterosaurs, you got to have that. Because you see, if you're flying in the air for a good amount of time, uh, you need to have very strong muscles in the shoulders, back, and arms. And so that's probably why they actually had very supreme strength in their, in their arms. And like other pterosaurs, Quetzalcoatlus uh, in the brain actually has uh, a, ver a portion of the brain that actually may actually able to co collect data for flight. And so I forget what the part of the brain is called, but uh, it's a it's part of the brain like birds like birds have this uh, that actually helps them calculate. Uh, everything about their about flight basically and you see uh, with this animal it, to be able to turn 90 degrees is a very difficult achievement but it can do it it can do it it's because you see uh, the 
part of the brain associated with flight uh, is larger than any other birds. And that shows that pterosaurs probably flew much better than birds. So that actually kind of shows that. But you see, pterosaurs are gliders. They're not really uh, hugely powered flight type of uh, uh, animals. It's because, you see, they don't really need to flap uh, their wings very much. They can flap their wings to adjust uh, their wings for uh, types of air pressures and also uh, wind cur and also wind currents. So pretty much that actually shows how strong they can actually be and also how they can actually manage to calculate uh, to adjust. So they were so pretty much its brain would have been going really really fast with all these calculations. So pretty much. Uh, it, it could actually be doing calculus like crazy in its brain. You know, all this mathematics uh, in its brain would actually be off the charts. But you see, it couldn't do math calculations like on the like on the ground or anything like that. That's not what I'm trying to say here. In the brain, it actually is doing a lot of math math calculations, and so that actually kind of shows how intelligent uh, these things are. Now, Quetzalcoatlus uh, didn't have any predators uh, in the air, so pretty much it was pretty invincible in the air, unless if you're another Quetzalcoatlus going after uh, another Quetzalcoatlus' uh, food or was fighting for uh, territory or, or anything like that. But on the ground, if it was actually on the ground, uh, it would actually have predators, especially Tyrannosaurus, like Tyrannosaurus rex, because you see it. Tyrannosaurus Rex would actually kill the Quetzalcoatlus pretty easily. You wouldn't actually need that much jaw pressure to actually kill a Quetzalcoatlus. It's because you see, Quetzalcoatlus has very hollow bones, and so pretty much get a get a bite on the neck, it's all over. And of course, with the extinction uh, for a Quetzalcoatlus, it's basically the same fate uh, like with all the other dinosaurs and other and not the last elite. Uh, pretty much one of the last pterosaurs to actually ever lived and so same events uh, in the KPG uh, extinction so pretty much 66 or 65.5 million years ago same fate all right that's it for now now this Saturday we'll actually be answering questions episode so if you actually got a question about dinosaurs or any, or any other prehistoric, prehistoric life Feel free to email me at dinochris71 at gmail.com or otherwise go on my Facebook page, Producer Facts with Dino Chris. Like the page, you can actually post your questions in the comment section on any Facebook post. But remember, keep your questions short and to the point. And also, for, and also you can follow me on Twitter at CSGRALL. That's my Twitter page. I post pretty cool stuff on there. And also, for younger people out there, make sure to listen to your parents, your teachers, and your guardians. So Parents, your teachers, and your guardians. So that's the best motivation you can have for a good education. It's very important to have a good education. With a good education, get a good job in the future. All right, that's it for now, and I'll see you guys this Saturday.